Do you want to make the best chocolate syrup? Good, because I have a simple, all natural, one ingredient trick that will improve the flavor and mixability of the syrup, and it was patented by the makers of Bosco Milk Amplifier back in 1928. The method is still used today by many syrup manufacturers, and if you are into brewing or distilling, you'll find some similarities in this recipe that will just make perfect sense once you see it. So if you wanna make a better chocolate syrup for milkshakes, egg creams, cocktails, soda, or just plain chocolate milk, then stick around because I'm gonna show you how to do it today. I'm Darcy O'Neill and this is Art of Drink. Basic chocolate syrup is three ingredients, water, sugar, and cocoa powder. But the invention of Bosco chocolate syrup back in 1928 added a fourth ingredient that made things significantly better. And if you aren't familiar with Bosco, maybe these will jog your memory. It's Bosco. <laughs> you know, the, the chocolate syrup. I, I love that stuff. I pour it in milk. It's my favorite drink. <laughs> Bosco drinks his Bosco. Bosco drinks his Bosco. Bosco loves his Bosco. You love Bosco too? You can still buy Bosco today. So what was the issue with simple three ingredient chocolate syrup that required a fourth ingredient? Well, chocolate and specifically cocoa powder contain a lot of starch, between five and 7%. And if you have ever made gravy or thickened a sauce with starch, you'll know what a small amount of starch can do. The thickening power of starch and cocoa powder made bottled chocolate syrups difficult to work with. They either seized up in the bottle because they were too thick or they didn't mix freely with drinks, again, because they were too thick. And some of them had a powdery texture. And any kid who's trying to make a chocolate milk with pure cocoa powder, understands that, myself included when I was young. You could make a chocolate syrup with less cocoa powder and it would actually be more stable, but if you want that really deep delicious chocolate flavor, more cocoa powder makes a better drink. Also, it's the only way to make it less sweet. But the more you use, the thicker it gets, and now we have a conundrum. And sure, the syrup is actually fine when it's freshly made, so when it's hot, it's very fluid, and as you see on most YouTube videos, it looks fine. But if you leave that overnight in the fridge, you're gonna end up with something with the consistency of pudding, and this is something a lot of the YouTube videos don't show you the next day. The solution to this problem was solved by the Wallerstein Company back in 1928. This company was mostly involved in the brewing industry, making hop concentrates, Burton salts, and other brewing aids, but they also worked with enzyme. And they filed this patent in 1928 in describing the use of enzymes to break down the starches in cocoa powder. And this recipe would become a Bosco chocolate syrup. Now, if you've ever brewed beer, or tour to whiskey distillery, you know that enzymes break down starchy material into simple sugars. They are also naturally found in malted grains and humans come fully equipped with them. That's how we digest things. Cacao is a seed much like corn and they are both packed with a lot of starch, but the enzymes don't work on the starch in this crystal form found in seeds. So to break it down, you need to do this process called gelatinization, which is just a fancy way of saying you need to cook it. Every bourbon or grit maker needs to do this with the corn because it unravels the starches, making it easier to digest. In the case of grits, cooking the corn makes it easier for us to digest. And for bourbon making, this gelatinization process makes it easier for the enzymes to break down the starch into simple sugars, which will eventually be used by yeast to produce alcohol. We need to do this with our cocoa powder as well. And most recipes for chocolate syrup heat the mixture anyway. It makes the chocolate or cocoa powder seem more soluble in water, but it just swells the starch into that gelatinized form, which will, as it cools down, will thicken the syrup. For the recipe today, we will do the same cooking step, but we're gonna add one extra step where we add a simple enzyme to break it down, break down those starches into simple sugar and it won't thicken our chocolate sauce anymore. An additional benefit of this method is that it unlocks all of the chocolate flavor because the compounds are bound up in that starch. And this basic re recipe requires one simple enzyme. The enzyme we will be using today is alpha amylase. That's the enzyme most commonly used in beer brewing and whiskey making. Uh, it's naturally present in germinated grains, but it's also present in your mouth because it's a component of saliva. You can't really taste amylase because it's in our body all the time or in our mouth all the time, and our bodies just learn to ignore it like the flavor of water. An important note is that the gelatinization cooking temperature 
uh, require some control as higher temperatures can denature your enzyme. So controlling the heat is important but it's actually fairly simple and I'll show you a method. Basic alpha amylase has an optimum temperature range between 66 and 71 degrees uh, Celsius, Fahrenheit here, and ideally in a pH range of 4.5 to 7. The alpha amylase will work at a lower temperature, but it's very slow. At the prescribed temperatures mentioned above, it only takes 15 to 20 minutes for it to break down all the starches in your cocoa powder. You can also get high temperature alpha amylase, often called distillers enzymes, and it's stable up to the boiling point. So you don't actually need to control the temperature that closely. And you get a package, a 15 gram package of it for $3, and that's enough for 15 to 30 batches, one liter, one quart batches of chocolate syrup. So let me show you how to make it. It's really simple. And just a quick word on safety, because this is a low acid product, uh, technically no acid as the pH is about neutral on this. That means food foodborne illnesses can thrive in it, so it does need to be refrigerated after you make it. Also, you need to have at least equal parts sugar and water to have a water activity that bacteria like botulism won't thrive in. That means low calorie chocolate syrup needs a preservative, but I'll talk about that in a different video. Lowering the pH could be helpful, but remember to prevent botulism, the pH needs to be below 4.6 and milk curdles around 4.8. Since most chocolate syrup finds its way into milk products, you need to have some finesse when adjusting the pH or you're going to curdle your milk and get chunky chocolate milk. I'll deal with that in a different video, but for now, just refrigerate the syrup after you make it. Now on to making the chocolate syrup. To make the chocolate syrup is really easy. You're going to need 200 grams of cocoa powder, uh, preferably low fat. All of these ones are less than 1%. You just don't want an oil slick of cocoa butter floating on top of your syrup. Optionally, 100 grams of sugar to mix with the cocoa powder in the pot just so that it helps prevent clumps when you add the water. And then you're going to need 800 mils of water and one gram of alpha amylase. And you're also going to need 1,000 grams of sugar and we're going to save that for the end. But it's really simple to make. We're just going to add the cocoa powder to the pot. And then we're going to add the sugar. And just give that a, a whisking just to kind of coarsely combine it. You're still going to get chunks, but this is just going to be easier than actually just putting water and cocoa powder together. And once that's roughly mixed, I add a quarter of my alpha amylase at this point. If you're using high temperature enzyme, you can add it all right now. But if you're not using the high temperature stuff, uh, reserve three quarters of it once we get the temperature down. Because we're going to first gelatinize these starches in this, and then we're going to use the enzyme. And now you want to add your 800 mils of water. And this recipe is going to make roughly two liters. Now that you have everything combined, you just want to apply some heat to get this up to the boiling point. And then you want to pull it back a little bit and let it simmer for 15 to 20 minutes. You know, if you're in a rush, you can do it in 10, but the more you gelatinize the starch, the easier it will be for the enzyme to digest it. And again, if you're using distiller's enzyme, uh, this will be done in one step. If you're just using regular alpha amylase, you need to hold back because these high temperatures will denature the enzyme and it won't break down the starches. So get some heat going on this and get it up to the simmering. Make sure you mix this constantly. It will foam up and if you turn your back on it, it's probably going to spill over onto your stove top. So there is a lot of foaming that's going on, but uh, as long as you keep an eye on it, it should be fine. Just stir it down or reduce the heat. So while I'm letting this gelatinize, I previously made a batch without any enzyme. Just wanted to show you how thick this gets. This is the same thing without sugar. So the same recipe with no sugar in it. And when you pick it up, you literally have pudding. It will, I mean, it flows a little bit, but it's pretty thick and goopy. And this is just cocoa powder and water. We haven't even dissolved this sugar into it yet. And so this becomes your problem. If it's that thick with just water and cocoa powder, uh, as soon as you add sugar, you're going to get a much, much thicker consistency, and that just does not mix well in drinks.
You want to be below 70 degrees Celsius or 150 Fahrenheit before you add your alpha amylase if you're not using the high temperature alpha amylase. Otherwise, your enzymes will be denatured and it won't work. Now, as we get closer to that 70 degree number, one of the things we have to do is kind of hold it around 63 degrees Celsius to 70 degrees Celsius or you know, 150 Fahrenheit to 158 Fahrenheit. You know, the idea of, of a mash tun from the brewing industry, and I just use a thermos. Uh, so you can use a metal thermos. I just happen to have glass ones because YouTube's a visual medium. So seeing what's going on is helpful. So what you do is you can keep this on the stove, but I find the stove controls, they put too much heat into it. So you're going to go above that 158 Fahrenheit mark and denature your enzymes. So a thermos, you can just pour this in once it's at temperature. I do pre-warm my thermos with some warm water just so it doesn't cool it too much. So you put your yeast in here, you pour it in here, you close it up, and then you let it sit for, you know, half an hour or whatever. If you're in a rush, again, you only need a few minutes on, top, on the stove top, but you got to keep it close to that 70 degrees Celsius, 158 temperature for the maximum enzyme acti activity. But if you're like me and you're not in a rush, a thermos is a really good way to control the temperature. If you can't control the temperature because you don't have a thermos that's big enough, you can just wrap, put a lid on this, wrap it in a towel after you pitch your enzymes and just let it sit. Again, the enzymes will work even when the temperature drops below what's optimum. Uh, they just work really slow. I'm just going to add the rest of the enzyme since we are at the, the appropriate temperature. Just give that a good stir so that all the enzymes are dispersed. Now just give that 10 minutes and let the enzymes do their thing. So now that we've let this sit for 10 minutes, we're just basically going to add our sugar. Now that you made your chocolate syrup, you can just put it in a squirt bottle. Uh, you can hear that it's actually fairly liquid. It's not thick like this paste here or pudding. Uh, so it, it's more mixable with drinks. Again, we're not making a sauce. We're making something that's going to mix with drinks. Whether that's a milkshake, an egg cream, a chocolate phosphate, or a cocktail. But honestly, the easiest way to test whether your drink or your chocolate syrup works is to make plain old chocolate milk. And you'll see that you can actually get it fairly well mixed by just squirting it in there. You can use a spoon to actually stir it up a little bit. Again, the syrup is still heavier than milk, but it doesn't take much to combine. So whether you're working with egg creams or a fox. One of the benefits of this is that it is cheaper to make than to buy. And if you're a bar or a restaurant looking to cut costs, making your own syrups is one way to do it. And chocolate syrup, you're gonna save about 75 to 50%, depending on the type of cocoa powder you use and the price you get it at. Again, your sugar and your water, your fixed costs, your enzymes are effectively, you know, they're pennies. But it's your cocoa powder that's going to be your most significant cost. But again, this one glass is about eight cents to make for chocolate syrup. And depending on where you buy it, it could be twice as much. So you have a chocolate syrup to work with in any drink you want. It does work as a sauce, but a lot of sauces tend to be a little bit thicker. The consistency of this makes it really mixable. So whether you're doing chocolate monkey cocktails or whatever, having an 80s revival, this is the chocolate syrup to make, super simple. And if you need the documents, the patents, all the other information about making chocolate syrups, check out my Patreon page, it's all there. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.